thinking of becoming a paramedic? It's one of the most demanding jobs out there, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And with so many paramedics facing burnout, PTSD, and even suicide, it begs the question, is it still worth it? Well, the answer might surprise you, and we'll discuss it on this episode of the Medics Mind Podcast. Hey guys, before we get into this episode, I just want to remind you to give this episode a like and share it with a friend or someone you think that will really enjoy it. It really, really helps me reach more people and navigate the obscure waters of that pesky social media algorithm. So please like and share. I'd really appreciate it. Also, if you like what I do here and you're interested in some behind the scenes stuff, as well as the things I do apart from the podcast, like book signings, media interviews, and general musings, follow me on my social media channels. Twitter, it's Author M. Hennigan. Facebook, Emetics Mind. Instagram, Author M. Hennigan. You can email me, info at emeticsmind.com, or head to my website, emeticsmind.com. If you haven't already, or you're unaware, I have two full length nonfiction books available now wherever books are sold. A Medic's Mind, a story about PTSD, addiction, love, loss, my time in service, and finding hope. And my latest book, Woven in War, the quintessential story about brotherhood, camaraderie, and serendipity, all woven to the simple stitching of an innocuous Edmonton Oilers t-shirt. This story is featured on both the CBC and CTV. Check them out today wherever books are sold. And now, onto this episode of the Emetics Mind podcast. Today, I want to walk you through the realities of life as a paramedic. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's a tough job. This is a job that will push your limits, but I've also seen moments of joy, resilience, and purpose. In this profession, it's, it's unique in that very few other professions offer these unique uh, highs and lows. If you've ever thought about becoming a paramedic, or if you are already on the path to becoming a paramedic, or if you are a current paramedic, stay with me. I want to share with you five truths that may change how you see the job, how you see yourself going into the job, and it may help you decide if the job is right for you, both starting out and continuing. So with that said, let's get into truth number one. You can make a difference. Let's start with the good. Being a paramedic puts you in a unique position to make a difference in people's lives. You're called to show up when everything is falling apart. Car accidents, overdoses, heart attacks, or even just a frightened person that needs someone to tell them that they're going to be okay. Some of these calls stay with you, absolutely, for better or for worse. But I can tell you that the look in someone's eyes when they realize you're there to help is something really, really intimate and really, really special and really, really unique to the job of a paramedic. Knowing you're there for someone, even if it's just for a moment, makes the job worth doing. I'm going to tell you a brief anecdote in, in you know, in, in a call that I went to that sticks with me in, in a really profound way. And, uh, it was around Christmas time, snow, absolutely everywhere. The, the city of Edmonton gets crazy amounts of snow. And, uh, and it was a a really, really bad snow year. And we get a call to respond to an address for an elderly female who was trapped. That's how the call came in trapped. So confused, uh, we end up driving to the house and fire, uh, asked if, if we need them because there's a trapped individual. That's usually a fire job. And I said, well, let us get there and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll decide if we, if we need a fire apparatus or not. So we go to the house. It's a seemingly innocuous house in the middle of a residential street. And, uh, it looks really beautiful. They have, uh, you know, no Christmas lights or decorations up, but all their neighbors do. And it's all very beautiful looking with the snow falling and cascading down in front of the, the fluorescent bulbs. 
And uh, we make our way up to the front steps, kind of kicking snow as we go. And I knock on the door and the door opens and there's this tiny old lady. I mean, tiny. She's got to be maybe five feet maximum on her tippy toes. Like she's a small, small little lady. And there's an elderly gentleman inside the room off to my right, sitting on a kind of a lazy boy rocking chair. And these people are old. I mean, old, old, like pushing, you know, mid nineties old. And she invites us in. And so we bang our boots. We walk in. I ask her kind of what's going on today. And she's kind of sheepish at first and not really giving us a full, uh, picture of what's, what's really going on or why they called. There's no clear direction, uh, no clear medical complaint. And so I said, ma'am, so, uh, we got a call saying somebody was trapped. You know, is that one of you or is there somebody else in the residence? And they said, no, no, it's, um, you know, I, I, I just, oh, I don't know. And so at this point, both my partner and I kind of understand that there's, there's something else at play here. And, uh, so we start prying a little bit more gently trying to coax out what's, what the deal, a part of being a paramedic is also being a detective in a way, not in the sense of being a police detective where there's very clear guidelines on what detective means. And so I'm in no way trying to rob that term and easily transpose it to top of what I did. But, um, in colloquial terms, you got to decipher things. You got to investigate. You have to take what you see and all the things in your surroundings. You got to piece everything together and come up with uh, a formula of, uh, you know, what you can do going forward, what the scene actually is telling you, what the, the call is actually all about. And what we deduced was that they were not trapped in the current moment. They were afraid of being trapped. With all the snow that was falling, they were afraid that they would not be able to get out of their house, which is a a really valid concern. And so we said, oh, um, you know, don't you have a snowblower or family? And and then the gentleman spoke up and he's kind of speaking through mumbles. He doesn't speak very well. So I went over and kneeled down beside him, asked him to repeat himself. And he basically said he doesn't move around very well. Right. His hips don't work very well. He had a hip replacement surgery about a year and a half prior. And so neither one of them are very mobile. They also don't have family around. No kids, uh, in the picture. Um, there was, I mean, they had kids, but there was nobody close by and, you know, family dynamics are uh, unique to every family. So I didn't press too hard as to why the, there was no kids there to help them. They really didn't have a lot of help and, and they were feeling really stuck and they had no idea what to do. So they called 911. The reason they wanted us is because they wanted us to shovel their steps and their driveway and a walkway. Now, this is not a typical 911 emergency and it's not a typical paramedic call. So my partner and I kind of look at each other and, and obviously we're tired. You know, we've been running for most of the night. Uh, it's a busy city service and uh, there's things to be done. But I couldn't fathom a reason why we couldn't help these people out and neither could my partner. And before I even said anything, he had left to go to the truck and grab our shovel. (laughs) And, uh, and, and so I asked him, do you have a shovel miss? And and she said, yes, yes. And she shows me where it is. So I grab a shovel and both my partner and her out there for probably a good 40 minutes or so shoveling off the steps and the walkway and the driveway so that they could get in and out. And, uh, and they were so eternally grateful for that. They were so really, really uh, happy and and pleased by, you know, the, the generosity of, of paramedics, not just us, but paramedics in general in that moment. And we brought so much relief to them just by being willing to understand what they were going through and, and have an empathetic ear and for taking the time to, to shovel a driveway. Now, you're never going to learn that in paramedic school. There's no protocol for shoveling someone's driveway. There's no, you know, TV episode where they're showing lights and sirens to go and clean off a a driveway and some steps for old people. But it is a call that does come up from time to time. This is not unique to just Edmonton. This is a, you know, there's, there's many circumstances where paramedics go and do things that isn't really a direct connection to their job. Much like the cliche of firefighters saving a kitten from a tree, Uh, you know, it's not directly linked to, to their job, but they, they do it right. It's a, it's a thing that they do. And so that is an area where you can make a difference, right? You go to a call like that, that is completely 
outside of the general scope of what you're going to do as a paramedic and the things that you generally think of when you sign on to your shift. And, you know, when you think about car accidents and the things I mentioned earlier, overdoses, heart attacks, and um, things like that. But, you know, of course you make a difference in those moments by going there. Sometimes, however, it's too late and, and you can't help the individual and that can make you feel really helpless. So when you get instances like this, where you have something really, really innocent, uh, such as dry, uh, shoveling a driveway so that people can feel like they can get in and out, uh, those moments are very rewarding and they are again, very unique to the profession of being a paramedic. So that is truth. Number one, truth. Number two, mental health struggles are real, but they can be manageable. The reality, PTSD and burnout are real risks in this line of work. Uh, Irrefutable. Paramedics see things that most people only read about or see on TV, and sometimes those things can come back to haunt you. The rate of PTSD and suicide among first responders is alarmingly high. But here's the thing. It's not a death sentence. With the right tools, it's possible to manage these challenges. Therapy, peer support, finding healthy coping strategies are definitely key and crucial. You know, personally, I found that talking to others who, and I'm doing air quotes here, get it, or who have been there, who are initiated, is one of the best ways to lighten some of the load. Uh, This podcast, for me, uh, helps lighten the burden sometimes and ease me of that burden. And, you know, some you got to find ways not just to survive, but thrive. And when you are a paramedic or a first responder, uh, I can only generally speak to the, the paramedic profession because that's what I did. Um, you know, you are, it's inevitable that yes, within the profession, you are going to go to things that will stay with you both good and bad. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the, the, the call with uh, shoveling a driveway, that's a good thing. It sticks with me. It's, it's part of my memory system. It's there. There are the other calls, the less than pleasant calls that stick with me too. Then there are the calls that have helped contribute to my post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis that I received in 2017. And I'm not going to get into those calls, uh, because it's a tough thing to, to, uh, navigate, but I do navigate them. Um, I've been in therapy now for about seven years and that's not likely to change anytime soon. I have, however, found a way to thrive. I don't just survive, right? My daily life isn't just net managing all my symptoms and my, uh, my PTSD. Uh, there is a component of me that does have to uh, confront those things every day. That's part of living with, with post-traumatic stress disorder, at least for me. Um, but you know, because you become a paramedic, there's no guarantee that you're going to get PTSD. The, because you become a first responder, there's no guarantee that you're going to end up with PTSD and end up with suicidality. Is it a very real possibility? Yes. Is it a very high risk? Of course the, the numbers don't lie there, but you know, there are, way more conversations about PTSD and about mental health now within the first responder fields that it, it, it might be a little bit easier to speak openly about what you've been to and what you're thinking and feeling now than it was potentially years ago. And, uh, and I think those are good things. We're making positive strides at the end of the day. It's, it's a tough job. It's a job that puts you into a unique position of human suffering And that is, that's a tough thing to navigate because, uh, you know, human suffering is not without its, um, after effect, you know, um, the same as you can get blood on your gloves. Well, you can get sadness on your soul. It's the same principle, right? When you are around sadness and you're around sick and death, those things do have a tendency to leak into you a little bit. And it's important to recognize that it's important to understand and acknowledge that, but it's also important to not bang on the drum of fear and say, you know, don't be a paramedic. Don't be a first responder. It's a terrible job. It's going to hurt you. It's a, um, it has the potential to absolutely cause you some great harm. Uh, it absolutely does, but it also sets you up to be in positions where you are sent to old ladies and old men and, 
uh, people who are just less off, less fortunate, and really be a, a shining force in their life and really provide them with some positive things. And, and that is such a unique thing to, to being a, a paramedic. It really is. And that's why, you know, when I said truth number two, mental health struggles are real, but manageable, right? Um, you can manage these things. You can manage PTSD. Even if, even if you get diagnosed with PTSD, uh, it's not a end of career sentence. It's not a death sentence. There, there are many people that return to work, many people that have a high function of life, even with this diagnosis. It is, uh, uh, it's a serious affliction. It's a very serious condition, but I don't think that we should allow it to have a mystique of, um, or an aura of, of doom. You know, um, there is life with PTSD. There is life after PTSD. There is life as a paramedic and there's life, uh, after being a paramedic. Um, and, the, and those are, those are universal truths. Uh, yeah, it's a tough job. Yes. You're going to go see some things. Yes. You're going to be involved in things that aren't ideal. Uh, that's just, that's the, that's the reality. It's true. But you know, if you have, uh, access to healthy coping strategies and you're willing to, uh, talk to peer support and you're willing to engage in your own mental health, uh, resiliency and, and therapies and find ways to, uh, you know, navigate those stressors, you can have a long and healthy career in this trade. Um, it is, it is a tough profession, uh, no doubt about it, but you know, so is, uh, being a deep sea clearance diver, right? But there's no guarantee that you're going to die during that job. There's no guarantee that you're going to drown doing that job. The risk is way higher for them than it is for me. You know, the risk is way higher for them than it is for somebody, uh, you know, working behind the counter at some sales job somewhere but it's, it's not a guarantee, right? So yes, there are inherent risks. Absolutely. There are very real risks and they should be respected and they should be acknowledged, but I don't believe that they should be spoken about with an air of trepidation, right? Um, having a, a healthy acknowledgement of them, I think is, is a huge, huge thing. This does kind of help bleed into my next topic. Truth number three, the job changes you here's the truth. It's like I said, it's a hard job. The job will, it will change you. Uh, whether that's PTSD or not, the job will change you. It's impossible to walk through life as a paramedic and come out the same person. Now the argument could be made that it's impossible to be 20 years old, reach 40 years old and still be the same person, right? Because you experience and accumulate different aspects of life that when you reach 40, you're not the same as you were at 20. Uh, the same is, is equally true within this profession. You're going to learn things about yourself. You're going to learn strengths. You're going to learn limits and you're going to learn things that you did not know before. There are days when you're going to feel on top of the world and there are days where you'll wonder if doing the job is the right thing at all. But that change that you go through isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just, well, <laughs> honestly, it's growth. And even though the job leaves a mark on you, it doesn't necessarily have to be a negative mark. You know, when we say, oh yeah, it leaves a mark. We generally think of that as a negative, right? It has a lot of negative connotation to it. And, and that's fair, right? It's fair to think that it's fair to have that connotation because it's generally colloquially used that way. Uh, but this job can also make you stronger, right? When you go through things and, and, it, and, and experience what you do, you learn a lot about yourself. You learn your own inner strength and your own barriers and your own, um, ideals, uh, as you navigate the job and, uh, and it can, it can absolutely make you stronger. It gives you a unique perspective on life because you see the human spectrum, uh, from super affluent and, uh, you know, what we might call entitled and, and, and privileged to the absolute destitute and downtrodden. You know, we go from a homeless guy or homeless girl with absolutely nothing to people that have seven cars in their driveway and, and, and this incredibly luxurious house that no paramedic is ever likely to afford. And you see all walks of life. You see that whole, that whole spectrum of, of the human ex, uh, experience. And you were called, you know, to show up to, to their respective emergencies. 
And so it does provide you with a unique look at the human existence and it does give you perspective on yourself. And it, it, for me personally, it helps me kind of understand my value system, what I value and what I look for in relationships with people. And it, during my time as a paramedic, I was not exactly healthy. I wasn't, I didn't have good coping strategies. I didn't have uh, acknowledgement that PTSD could be something I get afflicted with. I, you know, I just felt, you know, if I was having nightmares, well, that's part of the job. And, it, and, you know, you might have nightmares from, from certain things. You might also just have, you know, reflections and rum ruminations that come up from time to time. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have PTSD. PTSD is a very diagnosable thing, a very strict guideline for diagnosing it. Um, but like I said before, even if you get diagnosed with it, it's not a death sentence. It's not something that is guaranteed to take you away from the profession or take you away from life itself. Um, it's, you know, it, it teaches you the job, the profession itself teaches you about resiliency and it teaches you about making, you know, appropriate decisions. And it teaches you to think quickly on your feet. It teaches you, uh, about setbacks and it teaches you a lot about humility. You know, when you graduate paramedic school, you kind of feel on top of the world because you've, you've gone through this really unique training and you have this huge skill set and this huge knowledge base in your brain when it comes to the human body and how things interact and work with each other. But then you, you lose someone, you know, you go to your first, you go to your first code and you can't bring them back no matter what you're doing, no matter what tools you're implementing, no matter how many protocols you're throwing at them, they just don't come back. And sometimes you can contextualize it and go, oh, well, this person was old. I guess it was their time. But when you are asked to do those same sets of skills on, on a, on a child, for example, um, that has a whole other complexity with respect to acceptance of death. Um, at least it did for me. And, uh, and I had a really hard time with it. All of our equipment is generally designed for adults. So when you start using equipment on, on kids, especially kids that are malnourished or have been, uh, in neglecting homes or, uh, have just been in a, you know, traumatic situation, um, and the equipment is big on them and, and you see all these oddities with respect to the stuff you're, you're used to doing and, and you just, you just want it to work. You, you, like, please come back. Right. I want, please come back. I'm doing everything I can. I'm, I'm doing CPR correctly. I, I've pushed all the drugs, but the monitor is just blank. There's just nothing. There's nothing there. And, uh, that's tough. That's really, really hard. It's, it's, it's really, really tough. And it does change you, you know, because you're, you're likely, especially if you work in a busier environment, you're likely to go to more than just one of those things, especially if you stay in the career for uh, a period of years. Um, you know, you're, you're likely to experience some really tough things and, and it is going to change you. It's going to change the way you view the world. It's going to change the way you view television shows. You know, you can't, watch, you can't watch medical shows now and not look at all the errors and go, wait, what, why is he doing that? What? Why are they putting a nasal cannula on this guy? Like all the, all these things. What do you mean push morphine? You don't push. What are you pushing morphine for? Person's unconscious. What are you doing? Um, it, <laughs> it changes you in many, many different ways. Some good, uh, some, some arguably subjectively not so. Um, but yes, the truth number three is that the job will change you and you just have to acknowledge that and weigh that against how much you would like to change. Keeping in mind that we are going to change anyway, you know, life changes us, whether you're a paramedic or not, experience changes you, age changes you, kids change you, uh, many different things change you. So when somebody says the job of paramedic changes you, don't let that be a term of fear. Let that be simply an objective truth. The job will change you. Truth number four, and this one's a bit tough, but the system doesn't always have your back. Let's be honest about the system. It's not perfect. Many paramedics feel overworked, undervalued, and underpaid. There's often a lack of support from the institutions that we serve, and that can lead and leave some of us feeling isolated or frustrated, especially in the mixture of the work that we do. 
but that's where we step up for one another. That's where we should be stepping up for one another. There's a bond between paramedics that's unlike any other, much like a band of brothers with respect to soldiers. There is an unspoken kinship between paramedics that make brothers and sisters family. Uh, when the system fails, we need to lift each other up. It's, it's not always easy. Um, but that camaraderie can make all the world of a difference, uh, especially when somebody is feeling burnt out, you know? Um, uh, I, I guess a classic example I can give you of this for me was back, uh, when I first got hired on with the city, there was talk that the province was going to take over the, the healthcare system, the ambulance system. And there was a little, little bit of, uh, apprehension towards that because, you know, anytime a province takes over something, um, it can, it can suffer financially. And, uh, there's a lot of unknowns, you know, what union are we going to be part of? Uh, who's going to advocate for us, et cetera, et cetera. And because paramedics are such an un misunderstood profession, um, uh, we often don't have our needs or concerns, um, met or understood. And so, uh, we were placed in part of the nurses union and, uh, when it came time to negotiating contracts, you know, the, the province comes to them with an offer and it's up to the nurses and, and firefighters and police and everything to, to accept or neglect, uh, or reject, sorry, the offer. And, uh, you know, the nurses were offered, uh, at, X percentage of uh, pay raise. And we were offered zero, zero percent, uh, <laughs> pay raise and the nurses accepted it. And because we we're a part of that union and they outnumber paramedics, it was passed. It was a resolution that was passed. So for three years, uh, or two, no, maybe two years, two, two years and a bit, we were on a wage freeze. So, uh, we no no pay bump you know, at the end of an annual year, no pay, pay increase, uh, jobs get busier. Uh, I think one year I worked and, uh, the ambulance service responded to, uh, well over a hundred thousand calls, um, for service that year. And, uh, it was ex exceedingly busy. Uh, and at the end of it, no pay raise. <laughs> and then, then they started implementing mandatory overtimes and then they started implementing, less days off. And then they started implementing, uh, less, uh, you know, uh, schedule sharing. So switching shifts with people used to be something that you could do on a portal. They took that away. Uh, then they said, uh, sick days are going to go down to X amount as opposed to this amount and et cetera, et cetera. And it, you know, you start to feel really, really burdened and neglected and, and undervalued. You know, you start to feel like just a, just a number on a sheet as opposed to a human being. Um, you know, we understand that, that things are busy. We understand the nature of the job is that we're not always going to get a hot lunch, but sometimes we would like a hot lunch, uh, at least time to warm up whatever's in our Tupperware container. We'd like to be able to warm it up in a microwave and eat it. But a lot of times, most times we don't have that luxury. You can warm it up for sure, but that's a surefire way to get yourself a call. It's just the EMS gods at work and, uh, you know, supervisors and managers and stuff, uh, they all have, their own quotas to meet and their own uh, expectations with respect to the system, keeping the system running. And so, you know, a lot of times they just say, eat it on the way to the call or, well, you know, I'll try and get you some time off after it never really works that way. Um, but you know, that's, that's just the nature of the job too. Uh, the, the system itself does not always have your back. And that is something to keep in mind when you're entering this profession, the system does not always look out for you. You have to look out for yourself. And sometimes you have to buck up against the system in order to make that worth it. So, and truth number five, it's still worth it. So after all that is becoming a paramedic worth it. The answer for me, and I'm sure many others is yes, it is. It's not an easy life, but it's a meaningful one. The people you meet, the lives you touch, and the calls you can't forget. Yes, some of them are great. Some of them are not so great, but they help make you a better person. At least they have for me. They all become a part of who you are. And in the end, it's those moments, the good and the bad, that make this job worth doing. 
And I've been asked before, you know, uh, with living with kids, you know, I have two kids that I live with and, you know, they're my Sheena's kids. And, and I, if, if one of them, as they get older, if one of them says, I want to be a paramedic, I've been asked, would I talk them out of it? And, and the answer is no, I, I would not talk them out of it because, because my experience is not going to be their experience just because I got diagnosed with PTSD and, and I have these very real struggles in, in life. The, the, my diagnosis is very unique to me. It comes from military service. It comes from paramedic service. It comes from childhood. It comes from many different things that I endured over my 41 years of life. And now, um, within the past seven years, I've acknowledged it and I've gotten help for it and I have navigated life with it. But does that mean that because, you know, one of the girls want to become a paramedic, does that mean that they're going to get PTSD and go through all these hardships that I have gone through and, uh, experience the things that I've experienced? No, absolutely not. Is the risk there? Of course the risk is there. You know, like we've talked about the job changes you, uh, it's, it's inherent that the risk is, is there within this profession. That's, that's what it means to put yourself in harm's way for other people. You know, one of the medic credos is so others may live and that's part of search and rescue. It's part of being a medic. Um, it's, it's a tough job. No doubt. It's a hard profession. Absolutely. It's fraught with peril there's a lot of instances of post-traumatic stress and suicidality. And there are some real, real heavy things to navigate with respect to being a paramedic. So you, you have to acknowledge those things and you have to respect those things. But I think, you know, going into it with a, with a fear mindset, um, or at, or promoting the profession with a fear, uh, varnish, I, I don't think that's the right way to go. Um, it's a rewarding career. When you help people on their worst day, that's a pretty rewarding thing to come home through. You never have to question, did I make a difference today? Because the answer is always yes. No matter what you go to, big or small, you are making a difference. You're making a difference in someone's life and that's huge. So, uh, you know, yeah, the, the profession itself is, it is, it is inherently fraught with, with many, many challenges. But to me, that's not a way, not a reason to, to write it off. If you're thinking about becoming a paramedic or you are already in the field, you know, I'd love to hear from you. You know, um, if if you, if you have listening to this, drop a comment below, share your thoughts and, and some of your experiences. And if you want to come on the podcast and talk about them, please let me know. I would, I would happily have you on because, you know, I think that this is an important discussion to have because the need for paramedics is always going to be there. The, the desire for people to, to need, uh, someone when they call for help to have people that are readily available, that is, that is always going to be there. And in fact, increase as we go, as population grows and as, uh, health concerns grow. I mean, we just lived through a pandemic for goodness sakes. Paramedics were on the front line of that. You know, uh, I, I worked during H1N1, um, which was crazy. Uh, it was a very unique circumstance to, to work within. And I have some stories about working through that time, but that's for another, another day. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're a paramedic or you're thinking about becoming one, uh, listen to this, re-listen to this, uh, but also, you know, drop, drop a comment below or go to my socials and, and let me know what you think of this. Uh, because if you found this video helpful, um, I, you know, I, that's all I can hope for. Um, if you disagree with any points that please let me know too. I'd love to hear that because these are just my thoughts. They're just my ramblings. They're not written in gold. I'm, this is not the gold standard. Uh, this is not gospel. It's just how it is. So that's what I wanted to talk about today were the five truths of being a paramedic and is it worth it? And if you ask me, my, my honest answer is yes. Being a paramedic is absolutely worth it. Uh, just because there's high rates of PTSD doesn't mean you're going to get PTSD just because there's high rates of suicidality doesn't mean that your life is going to end that way just because the job is guaranteed to change you. Well, so is life. You know, you live life long enough, you're guaranteed to change. So 
I think the, the key is to understand, acknowledge, and respect the profession that you're going into. And so for those of you that are listening to this, that are either actively working as paramedics, have worked as paramedics, or are thinking about becoming a paramedic, I want you to know something. Thank you. You have my most sincere gratitude for everything that you do, you've done, and you will do. I love you guys very, very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Medics Mind podcast. If you ever have any concerns, questions, or, uh, you know, shared experiences, please reach out to me on my social media handles, the Medics Mind pod on uh, Instagram. You can head to Facebook and find me at a Medics Mind podcast. Uh, Twitter, same thing, a Medics Mind podcast. Wherever you want to drop me a message, you can do so on Spotify as well. Uh, I would love to hear from you guys. So please, let's keep this conversation going. Be well, be safe, and above all else, guys, keep talking to each other. Hey, everyone, Matthew from A Medic's Mind. If you enjoy what I do here on the Medic's Mind podcast, I'd really appreciate if you could take a moment to rate, review, and share the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Your feedback helps more people discover the show, and it means the world to me. Also, don't forget to share this episode with your friends, family, or anyone you think would benefit from it. Sharing is one of the best ways to help a podcast grow and reach others who might be facing similar challenges. And of course, if you haven't already, hit that follow or subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Thanks for your support. It really does make a difference. Be well, be safe, and above all else, keep talking to each other. I'll see you on the next episode.